Good morning. I, uh, I'm going to be continuing my series of messages uh, over the summer in the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And uh, today is the second message in the series. And we're, uh, we're going to be turning to 1st John chapter 2. And our text this morning is from verses 1 to 17. And the title for my message this morning is Living as an Overcomer. Would you bow with me in prayer as, before we start? Jesus, we thank you for the fact that you have given us the word of life. That you, in fact, were the word of life in the flesh, Lord, and you've given us your precious written word so that we can live by it, Lord, and so that we can be guided by it. And we thank you for the book of the books of John, Lord. Thank you for inspiring the Apostle John to be able to speak to us about the truths that you would have us to reflect on and understand. So God, this morning we pray that your word would be power in our lives, Lord God, that if there's anything that is between us and you, Lord, that we would just let that go this morning and that we'd absorb the things that you would have us to hear from your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we see John here, the Apostle John, as the uh, author of these three epistles. And John, John was an eyewitness to the glory of Jesus. He was an eyewitness to what he said in the Gospel of John, the Word. And um, in, in 1 John, the living Word. Jesus Christ, the very Word of God. He testified to the truth of what he saw and he heard and how Jesus, the living word, brought light into a dark world and how the good news of the gospel has the power to transform a life and to bring believers in Jesus out of a life of darkness and sin into the light of righteousness. And the letters of the Apostle John were given through the inspiration of the Spirit. When we have the written Word of God before us, these words are not just the words of man. These are the words of God, and He gave these words to be penned to paper by His servants through inspiration by the Holy Spirit. And the Word of God is truth. In this chapter, John does not mince words. He bravely confronts half-hearted Christian living and confused thinking about Jesus. And John's letters tell that everyone is either, and you'll see this themed throughout 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He tells everyone that you're either walking in the, in the light or you're walking in the darkness. People are either dominated by love or there's hatred in their hearts. They're dominated by truth, or they're dominated by lies. And John says that a person either embraces and confesses Jesus Christ as God the Son come in the flesh, or they lend support to a system, and the Bible calls it the system of Antichrist, who denies what the believer believes. All of John's letters issue a call. They issue a call for true believers to abandon their old ways of flesh-driven living and to walk in the love of God with wholehearted passion because it's only as a believer in Christ walks in the love of Christ that you're given the power to overcome the evil one and to live a life of holiness that is pleasing to the Lord. True love for God manifest in a person's heart enables them to obey the commands of God. Lots of people try and obey the commands of God by being good people in their own strength and they're unable to do it because the flesh is too strong. Now, John starts chapter 2 by re-emphasizing what he was saying in the opening chapter of his 
first epistle, about walking in the light of God's salvation. And, and this is what John says to the people. Verse 1 of chapter 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is our atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And John emphasizes that it is his earnest desire that God's people live in holiness, in imitation of Jesus, free from the shackles of darkness. People think that they're free when they sin. Well, the, the opposite is actually true. When a person sins, they put themselves into shackles of darkness that they are unable to break free from on their own. And when God inspired this letter to be written to the churches, He imparted His heart's desire to the Apostle John to bring revelation to the church. The Apostle John was a first-hand witness to the life and ministry of Jesus. We talked a bit about this last week. How he, Jesus opened the eyes of blinded people made lame people walk, multiply bread, walked on the water, so many different miracles. John was excited to be able to bring the message of Christ to the church. And this is, we believe these epistles were written near the end of John's life. And as apostle and pastor, John was motivated by love to see all of his spiritual children living in the freedom of, that comes from knowing and following Jesus. Steering clear from the damaging influences of the chains of darkness. John, like the Apostle Paul, would have said if, he would have been, if he'd be here today speaking today, he'd say to you, follow me as I follow Christ. I'm sure all of the apostles would say the same thing. Paul penned that, but this is how they lived. And this is what John's heart was. He says, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Why? Because he cared about the church. He cared about the people. He cares about the people in the future just as Christ cares for the people of the future. And we are the people of the future sitting here today. The gospel went out over 2,000 years ago and it has not lost its power. The gospel of Christ has every but as much power as it ever has. Because Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the power of God for you to live a free life is given just the same today as it was in the first century when John wrote these words under the inspiration of the Spirit of God. Some people think they're living a good enough life. That they don't need a Savior. Why do I need Jesus? After all, they surmise, I live a great life. I do more, be- more good than bad, so if God was just, wouldn't he just let me in? My, my works are good. Not like those guys over there. Those guys really mess up all the time. Well, no matter how good a person thinks they are, when they're measured against God's holy standards, God is holy, and there is no darkness, no shadow of turning in him. He is completely pure and holy. And when a person measures their life uh, with what God is, there's no comparison. No matter how good you are, you're not good enough. God has stated in His Word that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the penalty of all sin is eternal sin death and separation from him. When he says all, he means all. There's not one of us who can claim to be good enough to make it through God's standard. Our righteousness is even like filthy rags to the Lord. He lives in such bright holiness. If we were to stand before the Lord, on our own merit, none of us would be left standing. We'd all fall. All of us. Those who think they're good enough to stand underestimate their own
goodness and uh, they they overestimate their own goodness and underestimate God's holiness. We need a savior, people. The Bible teaches it. We're lost without a savior, and this is why Jesus came into the world. And most of the readers that we 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 see here that this letter is addressed to, most of them are people that understood the gospel, that accepted the gospel, that followed the Lord as the call went out. They turned their lives over to Him. They asked Jesus to forgive their sins. They asked the Spirit of God to enter them. And when you're saved and the Spirit comes into you, you are saved indeed. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're a child of God. Most of the listeners here were children of God. And so John, when he instructs the church, he's saying that it is the Lord's desire that they no longer live their lives in submission to sin. So he writes this letter, and he says, he imparts this wisdom from God so that perhaps they would listen to reason and would no longer give themselves over to sin. But John understands that there would be times when a person who does come to know Christ as their Savior would get tempted by lies and would make poor decisions. Who here has been tempted by lies and made poor decisions? I mean, I braise both my hands. You do too. Every one of us, right? We get tempted sometimes to make bad decisions. And sometimes we make bad decisions. So in this case, you know, it's not God's will that we sin and, and and John's saying, my dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. But John understood that there are times when a person who's come to know Christ as their Savior, that they would be tempted by lies and they would make a decision to sin. And in this case, the apostle is very quick to point out that Jesus, the righteous Savior, has come to our rescue. Jesus Christ is the advocate that we have with the Father God. Isn't that interesting how God came to us? God the Son came to us to make a way for us to be united to, to, the, to God the Father as well, to be atoned for, to be made at one with. Beautiful. God is our Savior. God is our Lord. He loves us. He doesn't want people to wander around in darkness. He doesn't want His children to be participating any longer with the kingdom of darkness. So if we do make a mistake, and sometimes we do, and sometimes it's not a mistake, sometimes it's a willful disobedience, isn't it? Jesus is our advocate with God the Father. As our Savior, despite the fact that we're guilty, okay, let's talk about Jesus as Savior. Despite the fact that we're guilty, And as sinners, we deserve the wrath of God. God did not want us to face a lost eternity. And because of His great mercy, God stepped into human history and He intervened. He came to offer fallen humanity grace and forgiveness in the person of Jesus. And that is good news. God came to satisfy His own justice against sin. He's he's a just God. Justice has to be served. And he came to satisfy his own justice against sin. And this is why he came to us as a gift, being born as a man from the Virgin Mary. He had no sin nature like the rest of us. And because he was holy, and because he was righteous, everything about him was righteous, including his blood. His life was was a life of righteousness. We sang that song this morning, there's power in the blood. There's There's power in Jesus' blood because the living God made Himself flesh, came and dwelled among us. And He offered Himself up. He sought to bear the penalty and pardon of whoever would receive Him. His death and the shedding of His blood were not shed for Himself because Jesus knew no sin. Jesus came as God in the flesh to die on our behalf. He came to be our atoning sacrifice. Atonement, atonement. Can't underemphasize this. Atonement is for us 
even though we don't deserve it, through grace to be made at one with God, to be brought into His presence, to be able to boldly come before the throne of grace. Why? Because Not because we're good enough, but because the atoning blood of Jesus Christ was shed on our behalf. So He died in our stead. He died instead of us to give us life. What a wonderful part of the Gospel. Sinners brought from death into eternal life. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made Him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. And as free believers, we didn't have a righteous relationship with God because our sin separated us from Him. But Romans 5, 6, and 8 explains what Jesus did. He said, just at the right time. You see, just at the right time. When we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died so that whoever accepts Him as their Savior will be forgiven, cleansed of their sin guilt, and born again in the Spirit. The Spirit of God dwells where there is cleanliness. He can't dwell in a place that's dirty and sinful. So Christ imputes His righteousness, puts His righteousness on us, cleanses us from sin, makes us holy so that we become a fitting place for the Holy Spirit to dwell. And this is not of yourselves. You are not able to be good enough. I I need to emphasize this, folks, because sometimes we act as though we are, but we're not. Christ died because we could not pay the price. His blood cleanses us from our sins when we believe so that we could be made at one with Him. And it is not because we're good enough. It's not because we donate money to good causes or we go and do philanthropy across the world. We can go to the other side of the world and and feed hungry people. (laughs) Unless we have the love of God in us, and that is only possible when the Spirit of God dwells within us. We're nothing but banging gongs and clanging cymbals. Why? Because we always have motivations and reasons for doing things that are unholy in the flesh. You ever notice? I can try to do things on my own And I can, hey, I did pretty good there. Why am I doing that? Am I doing it so that I can look good to to everyone else that's looking at me? So they can say, oh, that's a good person. He's a great person. I, I, I think he's honorable. You know what you call that? That's pride. It's pride. And what does pride come before? We all know it. Pride comes before a fall, doesn't it? Jesus Christ died as our Savior. John recognized that despite people coming to new life through Christ and accepting Him as Savior, there would be times when believers in Jesus would allow their pride to creep up. You ever had your pride creep up? I have. It's almost a daily thing where we have to, we have to go, Lord, well, it's not just almost, it is. <laughs> Every day, it's like, God, have mercy on me because you know my propensity to try and do things my own way and on my own terms. Help me. John knew that people would struggle with this. He knew that some people would yield to temptation at, at times and try to be the masters of their own destiny and, and as a result would, try, would mess things up. Whenever we try to do things on our own terms, ignoring God's Word, we mess it up every time. So in this case, John makes it clear that not only does a person need a Savior, which we're thankful that Jesus has been and is our Savior. He's rescued us from the miry clay. Is there in, a, in, a, in an old song that says, you pulled me up from the miry clay. Yeah, well, he's rescued us from that. But John makes it clear that it is not, it's not only a person's need for a Savior But a person also needs an advocate with the Father God. And thankfully, an advocate is found 
in God himself through Jesus Christ. Thankfully, the Lord Jesus Christ, the righteous one, is completely aware of what it's like to be human. He walked in this world. He walked through this world just like we walk through this world. Jesus walked in this world. He understood the pain and the suffering that goes on. He understood the temptations that we face, yet without sin. He understands, though, the feelings of our weaknesses. Thankfully, Jesus is full of mercy and compassion to us when we falter. And John tells us in this passage that Jesus is not someone who is unaware of your circumstance. He sees everything. He's all-knowing. He sees the future. He sees your heart. He sees everything about you. But he is an advocate to the, fa- to the Father. He's, an advoc- he's our advocate to the Father. And what is an advocate? That's a big word. Kids, you might not know what advocate is. Maybe some of you adults don't know what it is. An advocate, by definition, is one who pleads for the cause of another in a court of justice. That's what an advocate is. So thankfully, Jesus stepped in to save us and deliver us from the penalty of sin. Amen? But thankfully, in addition to this, Jesus continues to speak to the Father on my behalf as my advocate in order to deliver me from the power of sin. You see, when we're at one with God in our spirit, that relationship with God brings with it love. See, God is love. And it's talking about the very core of the nature of God. When you come to know Christ as your Savior, you come to know love in person. He's the embodiment of it including aspects of his justice. Everything about him. His compassion, his mercy, and his justice revolve around the core characteristic that he loves us. He's full of mercy. He's full of compassion. And sometimes he's full of discipline. (laughs) All because of his love. You see, as our advocate, Jesus Christ became our great high priest. A high priest represents humanity before God and speaks to God on behalf of the people he represents. And in the Old Testament, there's there's um, there's different places that show Jesus being the perfect high priest. Now, in the Old Testament, there were high priests over the nation of Israel, and these high priests would offer blood sacrifices on behalf of the people. Because sin brings death, the penalty of sin is death, there needs to be death in exchange for, for the sin of the sinner. So blood was shed. There's life in the blood. Blood was shed on behalf of the people by the high priest. But in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapter 9-12, The New Testament speaks of Jesus as a special kind of high priest, superior to all former high priests. And the writer of Hebrews, we hear this in Hebrews 9.12. He, speaking of Jesus, did not enter by means of the blood of bulls or goats and calves, but he has entered the most holy place once and for for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. There's power in the blood of Jesus. If we truly come to believe in Jesus, we take Jesus to be our great high priest. Jesus speaks to the Father on our behalf. He's our advocate. We will not only be delivered from sin's penalty, but if we truly open our heart to Christ, sin's power is also dealt with. God's desire is that we're liberated from the power of sin. And it's not God's plan that us as redeemed people, saints of the Most High God who've come into relationship with Him, would continue 
to be dominated by the power of sin. We don't have to be dominated by sin any longer. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 6, 1-3. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Well, sometimes as believers, we mess things up by failing to be obedient to God. Sometimes we get our eyes off of Jesus and get our eyes onto the things of this world and we neglect to do the right things. What are those things? Those things are sins of omission. Things that we uh, know that we're supposed to do and we don't. And sometimes we get tempted and we fall to sins of commission where we know something's wrong and yet we find ourselves doing it. What a wretched man I am, says Paul in, in his book to the Romans. What a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me from the body of death? He didn't leave people hanging. You see, some people use this, this reasoning to say, yeah, I can just continue to be living in sin and doing whatever I please because after all, what's the point of even fighting it? Oh, who will rescue me from this body of, of death? Woe am I, woe am I. No, he didn't end it there. He says, thanks be to Jesus. See, Jesus gives us the key and the power to be overcomers. His purpose for Christians is not for us to continue in the pattern that we used to live in. Sin is not our master anymore. When you've been bought by the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit enters you, you don't belong to yourself anymore. You belong to Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, 13 and 14, do not offer any part of your body or yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death into life and offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you're not under law but under grace. You see, what he's saying is if you try to do it on your own strength, you're going to fail. If you try to obey the law of God in your own human gumption, you're not going to succeed. It's only when you come to accept the grace of God and realize that it is out of pure love for you that He's giving you everything. And your heart is filled with such gratefulness and thankfulness to Him that you are in love with God. When you love God and your heart is towards Him, you will obey Him. This is the premise. And it's true. Does this mean a true believer never sins? Well, we all know that not to be true because we all fall sometimes. Every one of us. None of us here walks through life completely unscathed, do we? Even as believers, we're always facing this battle, you know? However, we have choices to make now. When I make this, a decision that is bad and wander from my home, you know what's going to happen to me? I'm going to find myself in a place far away from God in a distant land, longing to fill my belly with pig's food because I am so hungry. When will I come to my sentence to re or senses to realize that the pig's food that is offered out there in the world so far away from the Father's home is nothing but pig slop? It's nothing. There is nothing in this world that is against the, 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 the character of God that is good. Nothing. It doesn't matter how much money you have or how much power you have. All of these things are worth nothing outside of Christ. You try to fill yourself with the things of this world as believers, you're going to find yourself starving and hungry. Longing to fill your belly with the pods that the pigs are eating. But that's not going to satisfy you. So what is the Father's desire? His desire is that you come home. That you come to your senses. That you realize that the life that you're living is fruitless. The life that you're living is impoverished. And He's got a rich table to, to set before you. He owns everything. And when He... When, when you live in his household, you get to eat his goodness, his good food. 
that he sets before you. You're a king's child. When you come to Christ, you become a child of the king. And the king's fare is good fare indeed. It's not pods being fed to swine. It is the very best of fares. And God is saying, come home, my son. Come home, my daughter. Leave this life of compromise and come home. Give me everything you are and everything that you have and I'll give you my fullness. And that's a beautiful promise. The fullness of God for His children. Why? Because He loves us and He desires us to be one with Him and to, and to work with Him in His work. To put His ring on our finger, to put His, to put his robe across our, our, our shoulders and to represent His royal kingdom in a way that's befitting the King. Come back. If, if you're drifting right now, if you've compromised as a Christian and, and you're like, oh, you know, I've got this issue. I, I don't know if I can. I, uh, there's something that pulls me to, to this sin. Come to your senses. The Spirit calls out through the Word. Come to your senses, child. Leave that life of pig's pods behind and come back to the, hev the heavenly table that I have for you. And enjoy the richest fare. There is, there is hope. There is joy. There is peace in the Spirit that this world knows nothing of. And God desires His children to be at that table. However, if we persist and we say, no God, I'm going to do it my own way. I'm going to go my own way. Guess what's going to happen? If we're legitimately children of God, if we've legitimately given our hearts to Christ, He's not going to let us get away with it. No way. What father who loves his child just lets him go and do what he wants without saying anything, without trying to help? A loving father does not do that. The same way as our loving Heavenly Father will not do that either. If you decide that you're going to go away from home and you're going to live and try and fill your belly with pig's pods, you're going to endure hardship. Why? Because your father is not going to let you go without, your, without disciplining you. And this is why Hebrews says in 12 verses 7 and 9, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live when your life is going in a spiral downhill because you're being disobedient? Take heed. The father loves you. Turn and repent. Come back. Ask Him forgiveness, for forgiveness. He is faithful and just to forgive you of all your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness and to draw you close. You can come close to the Father's heart. That's His desire for you. Not to be listing, living in a distant land hardly knowing what's going on in your Father's kingdom. No, He wants you to be close. He wants you to be familiar with His business and what He's doing. <laughs> But as I mentioned last week, and I, I'll say this, and I think because John's going to say it again, he says, sadly, sadly, there's many people here in this world who claim to be Christians. They've prayed a prayer once, but their hearts were never really so surrendered to God. Never surrendered to Him. This person has superficially confessed the Lord as being their Savior, but has never really given their lives over to Him. This person has superficially confessed Jesus but never really given their life to Him. There's many people out there attending churches today across our nation, across the continent, all over the world who are not true believers. They have continued to live under the power of sin without surrender. There's been no change in their behavior. They cross their chest, they pray a prayer, they clutch a rosary, they do whatever, but their hearts are so far from God because they've never surrendered. There's been no yielding to the Spirit. They believe a lie that they're okay. 
They're in good stead. They treat the Christianity like fire insurance. It's good to have fire insurance, right? But then I can go live how I want. They are not truly converted. I'm telling you, if you come to the the throne of God and the Holy Spirit reveals the Lord Jesus Christ to you and you accept Him as your Savior, there is going to be a change. And if there is not, it is not legitimately you coming to know Christ. You're only learning about Him. You're not coming to know Him. If that's you today, today is the day of salvation. The devil is a liar. And he's going to lie to you and tell you, oh, yeah, you're okay. You're religious. That's good enough. That's good enough. Well, what does John say about this? 1 John 2, 3-6, to he says, We know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commands. Whoever says, I know Him, but does not do what He commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. So pastor, you're telling me? Yes, I'm telling you this. This is not my word, folks. This is God's word. It's not good enough just to clutch a rosary, to pray a prayer once a year or twice a year or go to Easter service or to go to church and, and try and be a good person so that the rest of society thinks that you're respectable. It's not good enough. That's not what it's about. It's not about religion, folks. It's about relationship with the living God and the relationship with your living God will transform you and He'll renew your mind. You'll be born again in the Spirit and be given the power and presence of the living God in the person of the Holy Spirit. What does the Bible teach us about the state of a person who's genuinely believed in Jesus? Let's, let's talk about that. Verses 5 and 6 of our text says, But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. I'm going to repeat that again. If anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made. You see the connection between the word of God, salvation, and the love of God? It's interconnected. If we truly come to believe and we obey his word and we love God, there's completeness. And this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. For a truly born again believer, the new life that is brought by the indwelling power of the Spirit is a holy life. And it doesn't mean that we're always going to live perfectly. But it does mean that in the attitudes of our heart, we will not be living as a slave under the power of sin any longer. If the Christian life is genuine, there will be a heart change. John 14 in the Gospel, John says, if you love me, in verse 15 to 17, you'll keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and will be with you forever. There's that word advocate again. The Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives in you and will be in you. The living God makes his presence inside of me, not because I'm worth, or not because I'm worthy in myself, but because he is worthy. And out of his own glory and goodness, he has extended his grace to me because of his great love. Ah. So, sin, yes, is paid for. We have an advocate, and we can ask Jesus when we mess up, we can ask him to forgive us and return home. That's the beauty of having an advocate. Jesus is full of compassion and mercy and he calls. If anyone sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Not that he wills us to continue in that pattern, but when we make mistakes, when we make bad decisions, we can come to the Father and he has his arms open wide. And he says, come on, come on home. Leave that life. And as we see why he's doing what he's doing and why he's teaching what he's teaching, we love him. And to love him means that our hearts are turned towards him. And when our hearts are turned towards him, we want to do the things that please him. Why? Because he's our father. 
He's our Father. A true believer no longer loves sin as he once did. A true believer no longer brags about his sin as he once did. A true believer no longer plans to sin as he once did. A true believer no longer fondly remembers his sin as he once did. A true believer is no longer comfortable in the habitual sin as he once was. Paul says in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. True salvation. True salvation comes in tandem with true belief. And true belief, by definition, is saving faith. Saving faith comes in tandem with and is actually, it actually has its beginnings with God's love. God's love is manifest in us because He first loved us. God's the one who took the step towards us, guys. His love's manifest in us because He first loved us. Dear friends, you see, John was addressing these, the church here, and he's not, he's not banging them on the head with a hammer. He, what he's saying is, listen, people, if you want to be a Christian, here's the earmarks of, of being a Christian. And if you don't have those earmarks of being a true Christian, then maybe it's time for you to get real inside and surrender to the Lord. That's why he tells us what it's, what it's like if we're not following Christ. In verses 7 and 8, he said, Dear friends, I'm not writing to you a new command, but an old one which you have since the beginning. This old command is the message you have heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. It is truth is seen in him and in you because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. The light shines in the darkness. The true light is already shining. If you've accepted Christ, you've experienced the light of Christ. And John wants to encourage you today to continue with that. But he's saying, like, if you guys reflect inside here to what my words are, and you're not finding that your life lines up with what it really truly means to be a believer, then you need to come to, to, to terms with this. And come to the Lord. He's calling you. And there's a litmus test he gives. He, gives, he says, anyone who claims to be in light but hates his brother or sister is still in darkness. Anyone who loves their brother or sister lives in the light. See, hatred and love contrasting what's in my heart. And there's nothing to make them stumble. But if anyone who hates a brother or sister, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in darkness, they don't know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. So this is one sign. If my heart is filled with hatred, I'm not united to the Lord. Because in the Spirit of Christ, there's not hatred. There's love. So John ends the thoughts on his teaching by addressing the various people in his letter. He wants to encourage them because most of the people that he's speaking to here understand this. They just need a reminder. They need a reminder to come back to where they need to be if they're drifting. And if they're just playing games, he says, guys, if you're here and you're playing games, it's time for you to get real with God and to give Him your heart and give Him everything that you are. If you're full of hatred, you're full of immoral behavior, and there's no change in you because you made a cross on your chest because you've gone to catechism when you are a kid or had infant baptism or whatever. It doesn't matter. You're not saved until you surrender your spirit to Christ. But for those that are, he wants to encourage you. Your advocate stands in your defense, and he's alongside of you. He knows how hard it is sometimes and how we fail sometimes. But God is there, and he's faithful, and he's just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from unrighteousness and to lead us on the path everlasting, conforming us to the image of Christ. He says this in closing. I'm writing you to... I like this because... 
His address is to the church. And my address to you this morning is reflective of this too. God sees your heart and he knows where you're at. And what John says to the church here and what I'm reading to you here, he says this. He says, I'm writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Praise Jesus that our sins are not counted against us. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you young men because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you dear children because you know the Father. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. And I write to you young men because you are strong and the word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. When we walk with Christ, we overcome. Why? Because greater is he that is in you, my brothers and sisters, than he that is in the world. Walk in a way that is in line with God's word. Why? Because you are a child of the king. Don't defy the nature that you've been given. You have been set free from the bonds of sin. Why? Because the blood of Christ has done it. You are no longer a slave to sin. Therefore, honor God in your life. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and each other as yourselves. This is the message of this portion of John 2, uh, 1 John 2. Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? Jesus, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the fact that your salvation has come. We thank you that you've given us very access to your, your, your throne room, God, and we can come before you boldly. Why? Because of your grace, Lord, because you loved us, you gave yourself for us, and you made a way for us to be close to you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, we just pray that as we go our separate ways, that if there's anything between us and you, that we would just lay it down before you, that we'd surrender, and we'd come back to our senses, and we'd come home. And Lord, if there's those here today that they can honestly say, I've had religion in my life, but I've never really known you. I pray that today would be the day that they come to know you, that they really surrender their hearts to you, Lord, and that you would give them new life as you promised in your word. God, you said that you'd, you'd make someone born again if they truly come to you, Lord, and they believe they'll be born again in the Spirit. I pray that for those here today or who are listening online to this message that may not have ever made that decision. Maybe it's always just been a peripheral thing for you, your Christianity. Today is the day of salvation. Come to the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this time we've had together. May your grace and peace rest on each one as we go our separate ways and enjoy this, this wonderful July weekend. In Jesus' name, amen.